This week in wrestling history, I got a good one for you this week. This was a week that featured two of the most memorable angles in WWE history. Both memorable in different ways, though. One is remembered for being one of the greatest. The other is infamous and remembered for being maybe the worst angle that they have ever done. And think about the ground that that covers. But we'll start 29 years ago this week with the first one, one of my all-time favorite segments, taped on October 21st, 1991. Did not air until a few weeks later, but it was a Superstars taping in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Macho Man Randy Savage had been forced into retirement after losing to the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 7. He was moved into the announce booth. At SummerSlam, we had the match made in heaven, the wedding of the Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth, and then Jake the Snake and The Undertaker crashed the wedding party immediately after. All hell broke loose, Elizabeth opened up one of the gift boxes, and out popped a King Cobra. Savage got attacked from behind, and Sid Justice was there, though. He was there to make the save. I remember him wearing this snazzy red sh dress shirt. So Sid Justice was there to save the day. Right, justice is served. And Savage began a campaign at that point. Every week, he, was, he would wear a shirt. Reinstate the Macho Man. He started a campaign to get himself reinstated by President Jack Tunney. And on this night, after a Jake Roberts squash, Jake got on the microphone. And he looked all the way over at the announce desk, which was in the back of the arena. It was Vince McMahon, Roddy Piper, and Randy Savage sitting there doing commentary for the matches. And Jake started to goad Randy Savage. He is goading this man into coming on down to the ring, which he did, although Savage told Vince McMahon, don't worry, I just want to get a closer look. <laughs> and Vince McMahon bought it. He's like, oh, okay. So, of course, he, wanted, he ended up wanting a little bit more than a closer look. And he got into the ring, and Jake attacked him, and he tied his arms up in the ropes... And he proceeded to grab the King Cobra that he was bringing down to the ring with him at that time. Now, a little backstory on this. Jake told the story on one of those WWE uh, Storytime episodes on the network. And I think it also came up on the Dark Side of the Ring episode on Randy Savage and, and Miss Elizabeth. Randy, first of all, Randy was nuts for even agreeing to let the snake bite his arm in the first place. Okay, let, let, let's just let that be known. But he wasn't stupid. He made Jake, backstage before the show, demonstrate. He wanted him to demonstrate that the snake was, in fact, not poisonous, that it was not venomous, it had been devenomized. And Jake was pissed that Randy would even think that he would put him in danger like that. But he got the snake. He's like, all right, fine. And he, he had the snake bite him uh, on the leg. So Jake has the snake bite him on the leg. I guess to prove that he wouldn't die. But he got hot about it. Jake was very upset about this. So, <laughs> before the angle, uh, Jake was smacking the snake around. He was smacking that snake around nice and hard to get it uh, all pissed off and all riled up and all mean before it bit Randy. And that thing latched on to Savage's arm like the jaws of life. If you go back and you watch that segment. Now, there are two versions of this segment. I remember watching them both on TV. The first one was the unedited, uncensored version. And then I think on the shows uh, thereafter. Or if this aired on Superstars, and probably what happened is like the next day on Wrestling Challenge. They aired it with a giant red X. Right before the snake bit Randy's arm, they put a giant red X on the screen. So you couldn't see what was going on, which really was just freaking annoying. Uh, so, depending on uh, which version you may have watched when you were younger, you probably saw one or the other. But when Jake tried to pull the snake off, the Cobra would not let go. And if you go back and you watch this segment again, there's a jump cut in the editing. Uh, if you watch it back, because it took a while to get that snake off. Jake has said it took over a minute. It took over 60 seconds to get that snake to finally let go. Even if you account for wrestler exaggeration. <laughs> It probably took a good 20 or 30 seconds to get that snake off of this guy's arm. 
you could see the bloody wound on uh, Randy's arm. Officials ran down. Elizabeth is in a panic. She's crying and screaming. She runs down to the ring. Roddy Piper leaves the announce booth. He runs down to the ring. Nobody wants to get into the ring because the damn snake is in the ring. Vince McMahon says that's the creepiest looking snake I've ever seen, which is true. The thing is basically sitting upright. Nobody wants to get in the ring with this snake. I mean, they're selling it like this snake is is a killer. I mean, they sold this perfectly, this whole thing. And at one point, they showed a little kid. Uh, it was just this one kid, but they showed this little kid <laughs> crying in the uh, in the audience. And Vince McMahon is on commentary. He's the only one left on commentary. And Vince McMahon laughs. He laughs at this child. Go back and listen. He stifled a laugh. But he sold the shit out of this segment, Vince did. Uh, it was complete chaos. It was just complete chaos and, and pandemonium. And Randy gets up. He's swinging wildly, but he's missing. He's acting all delirious from the bite. And they're saying, oh my God, we, it doesn't look like the snake was devenomized. They get him on a gurney to roll him to the back. And Macho Man falls off the stretcher. And Vince McMahon is, is like, oh no. And we had a great shot at the very end of this segment before it, before they faded to black of the snake is sitting in the ring upright and Jake is knelt down in the corner and he's a few feet away from the snake and he's just staring back at it and he's laughing. He's got this evil smile on his face and he is laughing. Great camera work. Oh, what a fantastic shot that was. Heel Jake Roberts during this period was as good as any heel that I've ever seen. So for all the discussions that you may have on who's the greatest heel of all time, what's the top five or top ten greatest heels in history, and I know I've talked about it, it's, I don't remember when, but I've talked about this before. But whatever list that you're going to put together, whatever company that you may have been a fan of at that time, I would put any of them up against Jake the Snake Roberts during this period at the end of 1991. He was so great. But you could not pay me enough. Devenomized or not, I would never... I mean, I would shit myself to let a snake chew on my arm like that. Savage's arm blew up from the bite. Obviously, he had some kind of allergic reaction. His his arm got swollen. It blew up. Days later, he had a fever that spiked to 104. So he had to go to the emergency room. 12 days later, as the story goes, 12 days later, the snake died so the joke is that randy savage was more dangerous than the snake was but i mean look they, they can never ever get away with something like this today or it would have to be some kind of like cgi snake or something uh, i don't know that anybody would be crazy enough to even agree to do so well i guess the, there's always going to be wrestlers who are crazy i mean we see some of them on aew the stupid shit that darby allen does and stuff you'll always find somebody dumb who is willing to do something like that but uh, they would never be able to get away with doing something like this today. And this was a heavy angle. I mean, for a Superstars taping back then, it's it scared the crap out of me when I watched it. I mean, I don't think you fully understand. This was this was 1991. Uh, I don't know what, uh, if I was watching cartoons at that time still, I mean, I don't know what cartoon I would have been watching on a Saturday morning back then the real Ghostbusters, maybe. I used to watch that one. Maybe Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But imagine sitting there watching Bebop and Rocksteady on a Saturday morning, and then right after, the Macho Man is dying in the ring. It's just, it's traumatizing. It's traumatizing. So this led to Savage being reinstated for a match with Jake the Snake at the Tuesday in Texas pay-per-view, and they did another heavy angle immediately after that match. That's the that's the angle where Jake slapped Elizabeth. Savage was, I think, uh, again, he may have been tied up in the rope. Actually, I don't think he was tied up. I think he was just unconscious because he had been DDT three times. And Jake grabbed Elizabeth, who was trying to, you know, kneel down beside her husband, and Jake picked her up and smacked her right across the face. And Gorilla Monsoon on commentary and Bobby Heenan, they lost their minds over this. 
you just did not see angles like this very often in WWE during that period. It was still very cartoony. It was a very, it was a family oriented product. So this this stood out more than most in terms of of serious angles. This feud never got the blow off that it deserved. It should have happened to WrestleMania. But Savage ended up with the world title. So I'm sure he didn't mind. But this was such an interesting time period. You know, we had two of the most memorable angles in the history of WWE taped within a two-month period at the end of 1991. We had the snake bite angle and then the barbershop incident with Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. That was taped in December. It didn't air on TV until January, but that was taped in December. So in a two-month period, we had two of the most memorable angles in the history of this company filmed. But also, Sid Justice had debuted for WWE that summer. He'd come over from the NWA, just a giant of a guy, lots of uh, charisma, looked like a million bucks, came into the company that summer. Coming out of SummerSlam, he was the one who was feuding with Jake Roberts. It wasn't Randy Savage. He was still doing commentary. It was Sid Justice and Jake Roberts. They did that whole angle with the the after party and, you know, Sid comes to the rescue to set him up for a program with Jake Roberts. So they were making the loop, doing all the house shows together and everything. I would say probably that was going on until maybe mid-October or so. And he tore his bicep. And that wrecked all of their plans because... He was going to keep that feud going at least through Survivor Series. In fact, I think there, I think it, I think it was going to be Sid and not Savage, had he not been hurt, who would have had that snake gnawing away on his arm, if Sid would have been okay with that. It's possible Sid would have been like, you know, <laughs> fuck off, uh, I'm not agreeing to that. But I, I think that was a spot that was originally designed for him. I don't believe the plan was ever to bring the Macho Man back when they did. He would have come back probably a few months later. I don't think the plan was ever for him to come back when he did. They brought him back when Sid went down. And I remember reading years later, uh, and I don't, uh, I don't remember where it would have been, but there were rumors at that time that the plan may have been, or at least some of the talk back then was, that Undertaker would beat Hogan for the belt at Survivor Series and then drop the belt to Sid six days later on that Tuesday in Texas show. So Undertaker would have been a transitional champion. Instead, he just flipped it right back to Hogan. That's not the definition of a transitional champion. But that was just one of the rumors back then. I don't know how accurate that is or if that was ever really the plan. But I wonder, you know, if Sid did not get hurt, would he have been the one to beat Undertaker and take the title at that pay-per-view? That would have changed the whole Royal Rumble match in 1992. Thank the wrestling gods that that did not happen. 25 years ago this week, on October 22nd, 1995, one week earlier, Shawn Michaels was brutally attacked, allegedly, by nine U.S. Marines, although some believe that number to be closer to 9 minus 8. In Syracuse, New York, and as a result, he was rendered unable to defend his intercontinental title on this night against the newcomer Dean Douglas. So he was forced to hand the title over to him at the In Your House pay-per-view in Winnipeg, you idiot. A reign that lasted a whopping 11 minutes when he immediately dropped the belt to Razor Ramon, even though Douglas very clearly had his foot not only not only under the bottom rope, but his foot was dangling outside the ring, which the referee somehow missed. And Vince McMahon on commentary very casually dismissed. He didn't seem to be, he didn't seem to believe it. He didn't seem to care. Now Douglas, he got his rematch on Raw for the title about a month later, a month and a half, and he lost. And he was gone from the company shortly thereafter. 24 years ago this week, on October 21st, 1996, Bret the Hitman Hart made his triumphant return to WWE television for the first time since he lost the championship 
to Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 12. And he announced that WWE was his home and he was not planning on ever going anywhere else. WCW had made an incredible offer during his time off for him to jump ship. They offered him nearly $3 million for a three-year contract. Vince McMahon called Brett up and he asked him point blank, what did they offer you? And when he told him, uh, Vince said that he couldn't match that. He just simply could not match the offer from WCW. And Vince McMahon did not want to lose any more people to WCW. He had already lost Hall and Nash and all these other ex-people from Hogan to Savage to Waltman to DiBiase and just countless other people that he had lost to WCW uh, over the years. And obviously he did not want Brett to be one of those people. And Brett said, look, I'm not asking you to match it. I just want you to give me the best offer that you possibly can give me. And at the same time, though, look, WCW was offering him $9 million. That, that's, that was the value of the contract. $9 million for working 180 dates a year. Far less than what he would have been working for Vince McMahon. That's hard to say no to. But Brett really did not want to leave. I believe that. You know how I know that? Because the first words out of his mouth to Eric Bischoff weren't, I'm in. If it was just about the money, Bret Hart, I mean, you you see those cartoons where somebody speeds off and there's like a dust cloud behind them? That would have been Bret Hart running down to Atlanta to join WCW. They're giving you $9 million, three years of job security, and you're going to work less dates than you were working in the other company. What's there to say no to? But he really did not want to leave. He felt this sense of loyalty to Vince McMahon. And he had friends in WWE. And it was the company where he made his name. And they probably owned all the footage of him. And all of this stuff that was very important to Brett. He really did not want to leave. He wanted Vince McMahon to give him a reason not to leave. So Vince ends up flying to Calgary to meet with Brett at his house. And he's going to make his big pitch. He's put together a proposal for Bret Hart. He offered Brett a 20-year contract worth over $10 million. So WCW was basically giving him $9 million for three years. Vince McMahon was giving him basically a lifetime contract and saying, I want you to be part of this company long after you're done wrestling. And the total value of that contract amounts to $10 million. So yeah, you're not going to get as much money in the next few years as you would have from them. But in the end, you're going to end up getting paid even more. That was the way that they structured the deal, and they shook hands. They shook on it at the end of the meeting. And WWE immediately began advertising Brett for a live interview that Monday night on Raw to make a big announcement. There was some drama the Friday before. Uh, He got a draft version of the contract that, uh, in his book, says it did not reflect what he and Vince had shaken hands on. Surprise, surprise! (laughs) He's told one thing by the promoter, and then in the end, it turns out to be something else. Now, they claimed, oh, the legal department sent you the wrong version of the contract. That's an outdated version. Yeah, of course it is. But to show you how close Brett came to not showing up for Raw that Monday night, it wasn't until an hour before the show. So that night on Raw, it wasn't until an hour before that show that that deal got signed. And in that deal was one of the provisions that Brett had asked for. That being creative control for the final 30 days of his deal. If he had to leave or he wanted to leave for any reason. That way they couldn't screw him over on the way out. He knew he needed some value on the way out. He knew what the company could do to kind of bury him on the way out. He wanted safety and protection against that. He wanted that provision to be in the contract. We all know how that turned out, but that's what he wanted. And I have to say this, you know, Brett has always been very, very complimentary about the way WCW and Eric Bischoff treated him during those negotiations. They rolled out the red carpet for this guy. Right down to Bischoff, Bischoff said, look, you know, I can get Hulk to give you a call, smooth things over if there's any kind of uh, issues there and kind of give you the lowdown on what it's like to be in the company. 
he was going to have Hall and Nash waive, or Hall and Nash said that they would be willing to waive their favored nations clauses in their contracts. Which basically, the, the favored nations thing, which was genius, meant that if WCW ever signed someone and brought them in at a higher salary than what Scott Hall was making and what Kevin Nash was making, I think the way it worked is that they would automatically get the same amount of money. And they were willing to waive that. They rolled out the red carpet to try to get Brett into that company. And Brett has always spoken favorably about the way that Bischoff treated him in 1996. He doesn't speak very favorably about the way Bischoff treated him in 97 onward. He doesn't have a lot of good things to say about Eric Bischoff. But back then, in terms of how they uh, dealt with one another, he's always been very complimentary of him. 20 years ago this week... On October 20th, 2000, WCW officially terminated its contract with Bret Hart, who had not wrestled since January of that year after suffering a series of concussions, starting with the mule kick by Bill Goldberg at Starcade that effectively ended his career. He continued to wrestle, though, for weeks, not realizing how badly he was concussed or that he was even concussed, and that just made things worse. They knew that he very likely was not going to be able to wrestle again. And they were in such dire financial straits at that time that they said that we have to just cut bait. So they fired him. And one week later, Bret Hart announced his retirement, officially his retirement from the ring. In a very WCW-esque move, though, the termination letter that the company had FedExed over to him arrived right after a separate letter that he had received approving his contract extension for another two years. And so ended the career of one of the all-time greats who deserved a much better fate career-wise. Uh, WCW was completely clueless on what to do with him. Yes, he did eventually win the world title, and he had that great match on Nitro against Benoit. But when your run there is defined by a promo about El Dandy and hypnosis, or psychosis, excuse me, then you know your run there wasn't all that you would have hoped for it to be. Two days later, on October 22nd, 2000, Kurt Angle defeated The Rock in a no-disqualification match and no mercy to cap off one of the greatest rookie years in company history, capturing his first WWF world title. It's either Kurt Angle or Brock Lesnar, and I have to say Brock Lesnar for greatest rookie year. In the span of a year, I mean, in terms of Lesnar, look at what the man did. At 25 years old, look at what he did. He pinned Ric Flair. He pinned The Rock. He beat Hulk Hogan in the ring with a bear hug. He pinned The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell. He won King of the Ring. He became the youngest WWE champion of all time. He won the Royal Rumble. And he won his second world title, headlining his very first WrestleMania. No one had a first year like Brock Lesnar had. But Kurt Angle is right behind him. 19 years ago, on October 22nd, 2001, one of the worst accidents that I've ever seen in a wrestling ring took place. Hayabusa, who was one of the bigger names in Japanese wrestling at that time, working for the FMW promotion, one of the best light heavyweights in the world at that time, was wrestling a match with Mammoth Sasaki at Corken Hall in Tokyo. Live on pay-per-view, I believe the match aired, when tragedy struck, he went for a lion salt, a quebrada, off of the middle rope, and he slipped on the middle rope, which was very loose, and he landed directly on top of his head, and he cracked two vertebrae, uh, his L4 and L5, and he was instantly paralyzed from the neck down. And it was the, the end of his career, it was the beginning of the end for... Uh, FMW, which shut down a few months later. And he did, I think in, in the weeks and months after, uh, is when the feeling began to come back in his upper body. But uh, from his uh, you know waist on down, he, he remained paralyzed for many, many years. And that night, prior to the match, and I didn't even know this until a few years ago, but prior to the match, they shot an angle backstage where Hayabusa he's getting ready I guess he's in like a stairwell and he's just getting ready and preparing to go out for his match a little bit later 
and he's confronted at the top of the staircase by an evil spirit wearing a cloak and a mask some guy in a cloak and a mask costume who tells him in japan in japanese of course that his career was going to end soon now that's eerie that is eerie and years later he eventually regained the ability to walk again albeit with some assistance uh, but he did he did walk again it took many many years but he did walk again which is amazing given the severity of the injury and as long as he was paralyzed for. And uh, he passed away four years ago at the age of 47. 18 years ago this week, on the October 21st, 2002 episode of Monday Night Raw, WWE aired a necrophilia segment with Triple H dressed in a cane mask filmed inside of an actual funeral home climbing into a casket and having simulated sex with a mannequin meant to be the dead corpse of Kane's ex-girlfriend, Katie Vick, who Triple H accused Kane of murdering in a drunk driving accident, even though we were led to believe for years that Kane was burned in a fire and locked away in a basement by Paul Bear. So when I talk about how bad WWE programming or Monday Night Raw can be, these days, these shows don't have a damn thing on the legend that is Katie Vick. One week after leaving WWE, Paul Bear watched that segment at home on TV, and he said that he never thought he would be proud to say that he no longer works for Vince McMahon. It was the one thing that made him the most ashamed to be associated with the wrestling business. And he was a big fan of George Jones, right? Former country singer George Jones. I remember when he used to have his website and his blog. Oh, he would talk about the possum. He would talk about George Jones all the time. He would go to his concerts. I think he befriended him over the years. And I remember in a shoot interview, he told the story. I think Raw was in Nashville that night, and he had gotten tickets. I don't know if it was for George Jones's daughter or granddaughter or someone. He had gotten tickets for somebody. He had to apologize. He, I mean, he didn't have to, but... He was so ashamed and embarrassed that he was the one to provide tickets to a show that had a segment like that that he felt compelled to apologize. That's how ashamed he felt. It was so bad that some of the cameramen who took part in the shoot quit the company right after. Fans in the building in Nashville that night watching live, they started a loud refund chant. And worse, they filmed that segment in a real funeral home. And there was an actual wake taking place in the next room. And they were making so much noise. I guess Triple H, when he was moaning and everything in the coffin, it was making so much noise. At one point, the funeral director for, for, in the other room had to pop his head in and tell them to pipe down. I would love to know what they told the funeral home they were going to actually be doing there when they first made the phone call and said, hey, we need to borrow a room inside your funeral home for a segment for our TV show. Paying their respects, I guess. They just never specified how they would be paying their respects. Now, some people are probably going to laugh at that and chalk it up to being, well, just one of those crazy wrestling stories. Man, that's funny. Man, that's an that's attitude era, man. That's a, even though that wasn't the attitude era. But it's like, an attitude era is such a crazy story, man. But let me ask you this. If that was your family in the next room, I don't think that you would find it very amusing. Now, according to Bruce Pritchard, he and Triple H both were embarrassed by the segment, which of course they would say. I mean, maybe they were. Maybe they were. But the way people in wrestling and Pritchard and everyone loves to tell stories and everything, even if they were in favor of the segment, I would be ashamed too. I wouldn't want to take credit for that. So I would say the same thing. I didn't want to do it. I was forced to do it. I didn't want to do it. But he claims that he and Triple H both were embarrassed by the segment. After filming it, they both told Kevin Dunn that they had crossed the line, that he should not air it. Kevin Dunn, allegedly, told Vince McMahon, I can't air this. And all that did was make Vince McMahon angry. And so the segment aired on television. Vince McMahon needs psychological help. Although you don't need me to tell you that. 
17 years ago this week, on October 19, 2003, at No Mercy, speaking of Vince McMahon needing psychological help, he booked himself in an I Quit match against his own daughter less than a week before her real-life wedding to Triple H. Linda McMahon was so angry at Vince that she warned him before the match, if you give our daughter a black eye before her wedding day, I'm going to kill you. Stephanie had been the general manager of SmackDown at that time, and this was their way of writing her off of TV. Vince was uh, not happy in the storyline. Vince was not happy about the job that she had been doing as GM, and he was even less happy when she booked Brock Lesnar to defend his championship in a biker chain match against The Undertaker. So he made an I Quit match between himself and his daughter. And the stipulation was that if he lost, he would resign as chairman of the board. He would resign from WWE. But if Stephanie lost, she would be forced to resign her post as the general manager of SmackDown. Linda threw the towel in at the end of the match. For Stephanie, she could take no more. And Stephanie was not seen on TV again for two years. Not until that Raw Homecoming show on USA. Uh, interesting little side note. There was a law or a statute of some kind on the books at the time, and there might still be, in the state of Maryland that banned intergender wrestling matches. WWE knew about this, and they paid the fine in advance so that they could move ahead with the match. And 16 years ago this week, on October 19th, 2004, WWE held its first ever Taboo Tuesday pay-per-view where the fans would get to vote on the matches. They would get to vote on the stipulations for the matches. Chris Jericho defended and lost his Intercontinental title in the opening match to a young upstart who had been pushed on TV that year, Shelton Benjamin who had also been a tag team champion previously. But on Talk is Jericho many years later, uh, Shelton said that it never occurred to him that he could be anything else. You know, he always imagined, I'll come in, I could be a tag team champion. The thought never occurred to him that it would go any higher and that there was any other championship that he could hold because growing up, he said that he never saw a black person be anything else but a tag team champion in that company. And I, I just, I remember hearing that and thinking, boy, the uh, the disrespect for Ahmed Johnson is very, very real. But if you're wondering how legit the voting was, because that's always been a subject of, of uh, some contention, a lot of people don't believe the voting was legit. All the people involved and even the wrestlers, they, they claim until their dying breath that it was legit, 100% totally, completely legit. According to Jericho, it was. He found out he was facing Shelton when everybody else did, watching on TV. He said Vince McMahon told him before the show, he said, you know, uh, you could very well end up wrestling Jonathan Coachman on this show because Coachman was one of the choices in the fan voting. He goes, you could end up wrestling Coach. But there were like 15 different names for that match that people could have voted on. And Shelton was sure it was going to be Batista because Batista was one of the choices. So he wasn't even thinking about being picked. So he was shocked when he got 37% of the fan vote. Batista only got 20%. Uh, but Batista, you know, Batista, though, was still a heel in Evolution. This was before he really started to take off a, a couple of months later. So it's not really all that surprising. Look, it was something different. They tried it for a few years. Uh, it failed as a pay-per-view concept. I was never a big fan of it at all as a pay-per-view concept. It just doesn't work. As a pay-per-view, it does not work. I think it would work as a television gimmick. So you promote a special edition of Raw or a special edition of SmackDown and promote it for a couple of weeks. Around this whole concept, eventually, you know, Taboo Tuesday became Cyber Sunday. So if it's a Monday Night Raw, you come up with a different name for it. And the whole concept is that you, the fans, right? We, the fans, will have the ability to vote on matches, to vote on match stipulations. As a TV gimmick, I think it could work. But for a pay-per-view, 
you know, people want to know. They need to know the matches that they're paying for. I know now they have the network, but even still, you want to know going into the show what the matches are going to be. You don't want everything to be a surprise. But I think as a TV gimmick to revive it maybe once a year or twice a year to make the show more interactive, I think that could work. But as a pay-per-view, it just doesn't work.